evening, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Raising Bulls, brought to you by the Beautiful Game Network, Golden Gold Press, and Rough Neck Scarves. We are the only podcast dedicated to the New York Red Bulls 2 of USL, or I should say of the USL Championship. Tonight, we're going to be recapping, well, I mean kind of recapping, a game that didn't happen. <laughs> it's the second time this year that we've had to do that. We'll talk about a game that did happen, although maybe... You know, I don't think it was so bad that we we would wish it didn't. Um, we will uh, talk about the, the game this upcoming Friday. It's a dollar hot dog night, guys, against Ottawa Fury FC, and we're going to close it out talking about the USL standings, the USL and former USL uh, Red Bulls at the Gold Cup, and uh, talking about a specific player and their future. I think it's going to be a fun one. We've got two of them with me tonight. It's not just one or the other. Uh, <laughs> who did, I guess I'll introduce you first because you started laughing first. It's Mr. Joe Steen. Hello, Joe. Hi, Joe. How are you? I'm doing okay. How are you? Uh, you know, uh, doing pretty well. A lot of uh, soccer going on these days, so uh, it's been a lot to cover. And um, Disappointing draw over the weekend, I, I would say, um, but they come back home this week, so hopefully they can get back on track. Yeah, I fully agree with all of the things that you said. Too much soccer on right now. I'm ready for all of the tournaments to be over and just have two leagues to focus on. Uh, and yeah, a little a little disappointing with the draw. I think it'll be okay, though. Um, are you having a nice uh, start to the summer? Are you excited about the 4th of July? Um. Yeah, I think I'm working, but yeah, oh, sure. I come mean, on, <laughs> working on the 4th of July. This is just insane. Joe, yeah. I'm, I'm going to write a note uh, to the company on your behalf. <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, also joining us this week, it's Bill Toomey. Hello, Bill. Hey, Joe, it's nice to nice to finally be back and have the Red Bulls be back as well so it's good to be back i feel like we haven't talked in like a month i don't know if that's really true but um, it, kind of, <laughs> it feels like it right our it shows very well be our shows have been so inconsistent because of how much soccer is happening midweek and uh yeah it's been very difficult but hey we made it through are you excited about the uh, fourth of july do they have you working no actually uh we're recording tonight tuesday but tomorrow wednesday I even get out early for fourth of july so uh get out at two o'clock tomorrow and then friday actually leave for las vegas for vacation so Ooh. i'm ready to go nice very very nice uh for for myself um we we've got a like a sister office in new york city that works with us they get a half day tomorrow uh but we don't <laughs> <laughs> hopefully you get to at least work from home tomorrow make you know nope. make it a little bit easier I nope think. going Damn. into the office tomorrow <laughs> Uh, and, uh, I mean, I do have off Thursday and Friday, which is nice Friday. Uh, my kids, they're going to be at camp during the day. They, they go to day camp. They're gone all day. I'm going to see Spider-Man all by myself. Oh, middle of the day. Oh man. Oh, I'm so excited. Oh, it's going to be great. Yeah. It's a good time. All right. Let's, let's get into this. It's been a while. So I wanted to catch up, uh, Red Bulls two against Nashville. It started really well. <laughs> the first six <laughs> minutes, you get a goal from Jorgensen, who is, you know, I think heating up in one sense, and we'll get to what I mean in a little bit. Uh, but he seems to be picking up a goal a game, which is great. That's It's good output from him. Uh, things look like they could uh, extend the lead for a little bit, and then uh, the defense kind of collapses on themselves, and Nashville starts dinking them in from distance which I think is an interesting uh, uh, thing for them to start doing, but it was working. And I mean, maybe it was uh, part of the weather delay initially, which pushed the game back. What was it? Three hours. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, but, yeah, about that. but you know, the team just, they did not look like they uh, were able to keep up the energy, I guess, from when they arrived to uh, when the game started to be played. Uh, what did you think, Joe? Yeah, with these delays, it's kind of tricky. I mean, you know, you, you you get warmed up and, you know, you're all warmed up coming out and then you kind of have to sit and relax. And, I mean, they started off the game when it finally started really well. I mean, Jorgensen gets a goal and, you know, as you mentioned, you know, he's been heating up getting a goal a game, which I, I think is really good to see because, I mean, we've kind of been talking about him, you know, 
from a development standpoint, you know, he, he, he got signed to a first team contract. He, you know, was up the first team, didn't really do too much and then comes down and, you know, he's, he's frustrated. And, but I mean, now it seems like he's starting to pick it up. Um, but I, I don't know. The, the, the defense has just been, especially on the road this year, it's just been a problem. I mean, the game before they give up three goals to Pittsburgh, uh, a couple of them offset pieces, you know, which we've talked about for most of the season. That's been their Achilles heel. And uh, like you said, you know, they, they tried to get a second and then they couldn't. They always had that 15 minute low towards the end of the half where teams start to gain an advantage over them. And Nashville was able to take advantage of it. Yeah. And, you know, I think when you look at the, the trouble that the defense has had, it generally is not uh um, related to when you see teams scoring from outside the box. I thought, you know, credit Nashville. They were really uh, uh, opportunistic. I think a lot of teams aren't necessarily going to be, you know, willing to uh, take those chances from outside, but they did, and they did a really nice job of it. But overall, I really, I didn't think that they played poorly defensively. Where I think they really struggled was when they were trying to move forward with the ball. Um, I, I gave uh, a shout out to this, during the match on Twitter, um, Preston, I thought, you know, he's a young guy. You see him doing a lot of the stuff that the team wants him to do. And, and you know, a big part of that is trying to break lines uh, with passing. And uh, I thought he did admirably under the circumstances. He was struggling to, to complete some of the passes. I think Nashville was doing a good job of, of cutting out passing lanes and intercepting them. Uh, and, I'll give him credit where credit is due. He didn't shy away from trying to continue to do that uh, where other guys might falter. But I think, you know, not just him in those situations, but, you know, maybe even a little bit from Bezicord. And, and I think uh, Lima had a little bit of a, a struggle. But when you see the midfield turning the ball over again and again, it's going to be difficult uh, for them uh, to to defend uh, those sort of transition moments. So I'll, I'll give him a little bit of leeway because I'm not necessarily going to say that it was the back line's fault. Um, uh, but, uh, at the same time, you know, we saw those, those issues in Pittsburgh, like you were talking about on the counter, uh, the counter on the set pieces rather. Um, mm-hmm. and you know, I think that's a product of a young team playing sort of that zonal marking that we've seen them do. So hopefully when you, when you plug in pieces like, uh, Nel- uh when he comes back, uh, mm-hmm. cause I'm sure after the gold cup, he's going to be spending more time with USL side. You'll see a lot of that kind of works itself out. But it's definitely troublesome right now. Bill, anything you want to add from that match? Are they going to reschedule that match or whatever happened? I, I mean, yeah. I know they got canceled I don't, the weather, but it's I don't think they picked a date yet, did they? No. I haven't heard anything. Yeah, I don't know if they actually picked one yet. I, I, it took them like a week or so before they announced um, the Birmingham match for October after that one was canceled. So I wonder if we're in the same right. kind of spot there. Um, okay. Well, there's, there, oh, sorry, there is one thing I want to. Well, there is one thing I want to add because uh, we and also with the defense, you mentioned that they are, you know, they are relatively young. And we they usually don't get their defensive issues sorted out until late in the season, as yes. we've seen in previous years too. So I mean, uh, it is, it, you know, it, it, it's it it's frustrating because you know you you see the potential with this team, and you like you've mentioned, you know, with with uh, Preston trying to push the ball forward and stuff, but uh, you know we. Y- y- it's more that you got to be patient because, you know, they, they usually figure everything out by the year's end. I mean, we, we've seen it in previous years. And I think for the most part, they've actually been better defensively than they have been in the last right. couple of years. Exactly. Yeah. I'm not really worried about them for the most part uh, with the way that they've defended. I think when you look at a, a team like the Red Bulls who play really high press and so much is Jeez. about. Whoa. You're right. Oop, there he goes. Um, and um, you look at a, a team that plays the high press like they do, and there's so much responsibility on the individual performance on the back line. They're only giving up 1.2 goals per game. So that's that's really not so bad. Um, but yeah, you're absolutely right, Joe, that by like the end of the year, they usually sort that stuff out. Uh, but let's talk about the game that actually uh, they were able to complete. It was a 1-1 draw against Charleston. I thought they started well. They nearly had a goal from uh, Buckmaster. It was a nice save uh, for Charleston, but I think Reese was also offside uh, on the attempt. But they were finding opportunities. They were looking dangerous. And then Charleston gets a red card, and it's absolutely deserved. Um, 
but when you look at what happened in the game after that, it really played into um, uh, Charleston's hands more than it played into Red Bull 2. They were able to sit back. They just looked for those counter opportunities. And, you know, true to Red Bull form, they really struggled to break them down. Uh, I think a big thing that, you know, uh, was problematic on the night as as good as uh, Jorgensen has been getting these goals, you know, every game or so, he tends to disappear a lot or shy away um, when the game becomes a little bit more physical. And I think you saw that against Charleston. Yeah, I think that's I think that's fair. I mean, he is only nineteen. We do have to remember this. He's still kind mm-hmm. of you know maturing into you know pre- playing in the, against physical teams and stuff like that. And I am going to will I, but I do agree that he does tend to, you know, drift in and out of the game, which I mean, I don't know if that's more of, you know, him being young and, you know, not, or, you know, it, you know, maybe, I mean, they didn't really didn't create a whole lot to, to be fair. It, it, you know, early on they did and they were able to grab an equalizer in the second half. But for the most part, I mean, and I even think John touched on this in his post game uh, comments, they really didn't create a whole lot going forward. Right. But I also think, you know, some of that, is Jorgensen was really he wasn't I, I when he works best we've talked about it where he needs a partner and he can run in behind so when a team's sitting back it's a little bit more difficult and he's got to be more willing to do the work up top with his back to goal which is where I think he struggles a lot right now he had I think it was only something like 12 passes in this match which is insane yeah. he played 90 minutes 12 that passes and only yeah, th- uh, only three shots so I think when you look at a game like this and growth opportunities that's a that's one to really you know look at in a way to get him more involved to get him a little bit more comfortable uh, in these types of situations and like i said i think you know a partner probably helps with that maybe having somebody like elney out wide because i thought mm-hmm. jorgensen looked better once uh, elney came in later on but by that point the game's pretty much over um but you know they got to do something to help him out a little bit. Um, otherwise, when you get a team that's sitting back like that, it really doesn't make sense to keep him up there if he's not going to play sort of that uh, you know true number nine role. No, I think that's fair. I mean, um, again, you know, we. I'm still. I mean, again, I, I still go back to the age thing where he's relatively young, and I yeah. think we'll have to see. I mean, because you know. Tom Barlow came in last year and he was, you know, when Brian White got promoted and he, you know, he got sick, he earned success right away. But I think we saw better from him this year was he was able to play with his back towards goal and be able to hold up the ball for his teammates a lot better this year as well. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And it seems like there's still not a player that's going to fit in Tom Barlow's shoes yet. Yeah. Look, I mean, Yorgi is scoring goals, but I think like as a whole, the offense has sputtered a little bit without having uh, a little bit more of a physical presence up top. But that's okay. It is what it is, is right Barlow now. Is Barlow still leading the goal in? I mean, I mean, the team in goals. I believe so. so yes. Yeah. He yeah, yeah. is. <laughs> I can confirm that. But um, hard to believe. Uh, and you know, we're talking about Jorgensen. Like he was terrible. He did have another opportunity for a goal. He could have had two in this match. So. You know, he was a little bit unlucky not to score the one. Uh, it was very similar to the goal that he did score, uh, except he was more positioned towards the left side of the the, the goal uh, and just put it off target. But he could have had his uh, eighth goal in this match should his one against Nashville have counted. So he would have been tied with with Barlow at that point, or I guess one more game played. But whatever. Let's look at the goal they gave up. Um, is Charleston sitting back? That means you see this a lot with both the Red Bulls and the Red Bulls too. When they have a man advantage, they'll push up a defender to to you know um, transition the ball from the back line uh, to the midfield or or look for attacking opportunities. Just a little bit of an overload uh, because of the numbers advantage and another team sitting back. This time, Jordan Scarlett moves up, uh, just like I was talking about in the Nashville game. He coughs up the ball. Uh, gets caught a little bit forward. The only defender back is Preston, who does not like. He's a, he's a quick guy, but he's not necessarily the fastest guy. Um, he gets beat, and it is a one-on-one opportunity with Loro. It comes against the run of play. 
Charleston takes the lead. It was really frustrating, but it's 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 similar to what we've seen last year when you've seen the defense struggle a little bit. Uh, it's where they make those kinds of mistakes. I'm okay again, okay with it because these are young guys who are still growing and developing. You're going to see this from time to time. I think Jordan is certainly not going to let uh, something like this really affect him much. Uh, but it, it is still a little bit frustrating when you see a mistake that uh, it, it's essentially one huge mistake that cost them this this uh, full uh, three points. Yeah, I mean, you know, it, it's a it's a frustrating result, absolutely, and it was easily preventable, but especially with them being up a man. But I mean, it is their third game in seven days. Yeah, their, also true. Their game, it's their game in six days. I mean. Plus, they had the game where they had to wait it out in Nashville. They've had to do a lot of traveling. Uh, and the field ex- the field wasn't exactly the most playable field either. So, I mean, um, Almost uh, I, think it's, I think it's a... Yeah, I think it's, I think it's a frustrating... I think it's a frustrating draw for sure. But I think it's one... I mean, listen, as long as they're able to get points on, on the road and, and take, you know, three points at home, I, I think they'll, 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 uh, they'll be able to... Um, They'll be able to take this as a positive for the most part. Yeah, you know what? Uh, you did bring up a very good point. The field conditions in Charleston are just abhorrent. Uh, they had an open cup match canceled there against Atlanta a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I'm really not sure what you do with that. This is the last year of that stadium, right? They're getting rid of it? I believe so. Yeah, so I guess it's just like, hey, who needs to keep up this field? But it's terrible. I feel bad for Charleston, especially, to have to play on that as their home field. Um, you know, uh, you can't necessarily blame all of the the issues on that, but it definitely was bad. Uh, it may be one of the worst fields we've seen this team play on. Uh, I think Louisville is probably up there as well. <laughs> well, it's a baseball field. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, that is true. Okay, let's talk man of the match. Who you got? I got two candidates, but I want to see who you guys have. Uh, Bill, let's start with you. I'm going with uh, Jared Stroud. He set up a lot of good plays and had a lot of nice passes. Okay, fair. Uh, Mr. Steen? Uh, I'm going to go with Jared as well. Yeah, all right. I I agree. I think he and uh, Epps were the the most um, troublesome players for the Charleston defense, but they had very little support around them. Jorgensen, like I said, struggled a little bit, uh, you know, finding or or at least making his presence felt in the box. And, you know, no late runs really from the midfield to, to ease the the burden. Uh, but congrats, Stroud. I think you've been man of the match the most so far this year, so <laughs> keep that going. Uh, let's talk what? about Ottawa Fury FC. They are 7-3-6. One, one, and three in their last uh, five matches on the road. They are two, two, and four. In that one, one, and three span, they beat Charleston. They lost to Tampa Bay. They drew against Nashville, Memphis, and Pittsburgh. So you know, there's a lot of overlap with who they're playing and who the Red Bulls are playing right now. Um, I don't think a lot has changed from when we talked about them earlier in the season. Uh, Moore Sam is still leading the team with goals. He's got seven, followed by Wall Fall. Which I don't think that's how you actually pronounce his name. Really? <laughs> yeah, I heard I heard somebody say it the other day, and I was like, "Oh, well, I've been saying it wrong all this time." But I'm still going to call him that because he <laughs> he screams out in, in agony every time he, the wind blows and he falls over. Uh, Cristiano Francois and Walfall each have five goals. Carl uh, Howarth has four. Kevin Oliveira three. Aiden Daniels and Thomas Mujiguer. I think that's how you would say that. Giguer has, uh, they each have one. Sam Howarth and Francois each have four assists leading the team, followed by Dakota uh, Bamathan, uh, Oliveira, Fall, and Charlie Ward, not to be confused with former New York Nick. Uh, great. Can I, can I do great in quotes? Will you guys see that one? And Heisman winner, Charlie Ward. <laughs> 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 not the same guy uh they are a fairly good defensive team we've talked about that in the past 18 goals conceded this year 1.1 per game just slightly better than the red bulls uh 
They've got 26 goals on 72 shots and uh, or 72 shots on target and 146 total shots. They're really well balanced. Uh, defense first. They can beat you on the counter. They're talented, but a little bit inconsistent. Not dissimilar to what we've seen what we've with seen. Uh, New York Red Bulls too. Last time out, it was a one-one draw on School Day in Canada. Uh, that early morning weirdo game. What was it? Ten thirty. <laughs> Jared Stroud with the late goal to make me pull my hair out as I was writing the recap. Uh, last two times they were at MSU. Uh, most recently, it was a one nothing win for New York. And the previous match earlier that season was a 3 nothing win for Ottawa. They just got shellacked that day. Three counterattack goals. Uh, Nikola Popovich is their coach. He had previously been with Swope Park Rangers and led them to the OSL Cup in 2017. Look, this is the MLS side, or MLS two side for Montreal, right? Uh, but they are still a talented side. I don't think that on any given day they are better than you know the top or the elite in the East. But they certainly can hang in games. I mean, three three against Nashville, two two at Pittsburgh. Those are good results. And they, they beat Charleston, I think. Was that at home or was it on the road? I think that was at It was home. at home. Yeah. So, I mean, they're a good team. They can they can get things done. The Red Bulls have been very consistent of late. Uh, they are still dealing with losses from you know the first team taking guys who have contributed minutes there, uh, namely Sean Nealis, Nealis and um, Tom Barlow. Uh, and, you know, injuries and having a different back line every game. It's been a little bit difficult, but I want to know what do you think we're going to see in this match? I'll start with you, Bill. I'm hoping that the Rebels can can win against Ottawa because it's been quite some time since we've been able to pull off a win against Ottawa. And not to mention that they need the points at home. Joe, where is Ottawa still just going to trouble them on the counter? Is there any other wrinkle, something that we should uh, be expecting that maybe we're not? Um, I think they're going to trouble them on the counter. I think they're just a very, very tough team to break down. I mean, even the game against Tampa Bay where they lost 2-1, they lost on like a last-minute goal. So that was, I mean, an unfortunate loss for them. I mean, they took the Louisville City was only able to manage a goal against them. They've been really tough to deal with on the road this year. I mean, they they dropped two games against two top teams in the East, you would say. The other, team, the other games they've drawn, they gave Nashville a tough time. Um, they gave Pittsburgh a tough time. So it's gonna be it's gonna be really tough to break this team down. This team loves hitting on the counter. Uh, they've troubled Red Bull two in the past. I mean, you talked about it last year. They get beat three nothing. Even in that one nothing loss, I believe Red Bull two was up a man for a good amount of the game. They still were. They still gave them a bit of trouble. So I mean, this is just one of those teams that just seems to you know have a style that counteracts Red Bull two and just give them trouble. So I mean, they're gonna they're going to have to be on their toes in this game for, and they're going to have to make sure that, you know, there's constant communication, you know, they're not giving the ball away cheaply and they're going to have to play a pretty good game. Cause this, they're not the, you, like you mentioned, they're not the most talented side, but they can definitely hang with some of the East teams. Yeah. I think, look, I think that guys like more Sam and I really like Cristiano Francois, Kevin Oliveira doesn't have the goals to back it up, but he's someone that's always impressed me. They're just they're a solid team. They have a, a lot of good players who can run at you and and make things uncomfortable and difficult. And that the Red Bulls, especially if they continue to be a little bit sloppier through the middle of the field, they're going to struggle. Uh, I think that's where you know you, you maybe start to miss uh, Jean Christophe Kofi a little bit because um, he a, a, and Lima and Zayats, I thought. Uh, functioned well together when they've played there. I think uh, he also uh, paired well when they've moved Stroud centrally. Um, but they they kind of have to figure out the group that they want to move forward with. And, you know, I think Stroud is very talented and uh, does a lot of good things centrally. Uh, but I'm, I'm always more impressed with his performances out wide. And I want to see him out there a little bit more and then kind of set a group. We've talked about that, too, in the past, especially last year when there was a lot of inconsistent results on the back line and in the midfield. They just need to pick a pairing that is working well together and just stick with it and see how that goes. That is obviously counter uh, to the development side of things sometimes for Red Bull, too. But 
I think that's where you see uh, the biggest areas where they, they could improve, which is more about uh, in-game improvements and result improvements rather than uh, actually improving the, the players de- developmentally. Um, up top, I, I'm interested in what you guys think they should do. Uh, I I talked about Marcus Epps and Jared Stroud being kind of the, the two players that stood out last week. Uh, but if you're going to continue to play Jurgensen, I think you need someone a little bit stronger up there with him. And I really like Epps, uh, but he's definitely more of a winger than he is as a sort of support striker. So, uh, Joe, what would you do with that front line? Um, I think Eleni's definitely given uh, given some uh, Wolniak well, some thought about playing him. Uh, I, I think, like you mentioned, uh, Jorgensen played better when he came in, so I, I could definitely see him getting a start. Um, maybe you play those two up top together, and maybe Stroud in behind, or Stroud on the wing, and then Epps on the wing too. Maybe I don't know. Maybe you do a four four like a four two 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 with Epps and Stroud in behind, and then have Lima and Zayats right there. Uh, but I definitely think Eleni's deserved some um, consideration for a start. And w- what do you think about Ben Mines? Because I think he's showed well, but you know we've talked about him still drifting out of games and struggling uh, physically at times. I think uh, I still think Ben is in that that I don't know if he's a hundred percent back yet. And like you've mentioned, it's been like this game's going to be a physical game because this is how I was going to play them. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, mm, I think Ben is. I think Ben's done well in that that like super sub role coming off the bench. I mean, he made a big impact against Nashville, and I don't think we're going to see him start in this game. But I think he, I, we could definitely see him making an impact coming off the bench. Bill, what would you do with this front line? Is it Stroud, Epps, Jorgensen, which seems to be kind of like the default? Uh, do you mix it up with Mines or Elney? Uh, Amarildo is back and healthy. Uh, one thing that we can talk about, uh, Omar Soe, I think uh, it might be coming into the mix. It could just be that he's training with the team. Um, he was there the other day, and you know it, they do that all the time with, with academy players, especially guys that are starting to stand out a little bit there. Um, but it could be really interesting if he's someone that they want to promote from the U23 team uh, in the same kind of way that they did with Brian White. Yeah, I mean, White's, White's made, you know, huge improvements and he's doing great on the, on the first team for sure. But um, as far as Rebels 2 go, I would definitely like to see Mines get some more time. Um, you know, in the, in the last game against Charleston, he came in late in the game. I definitely think he could definitely get some more time in this game. And I would definitely like to see Stroud played up front a bit more too, because he's definitely uh, been playing pretty well, and I think he's ready for another goal against Ottawa. That would be nice. Uh, and let's not forget, Mines helped set up that goal against Ottawa last time around. Could true. Be, could be very, very interesting. True. All right, let's get predictions from you guys. Um, I'm going to say two nothing Red Bulls two at home on Dollar Hot Dog Night. There you go. What do you got, Joe? Uh-oh. Joe, you're muted. <laughs> my head my head says draw, but I'm going to say I'm going to say they they come out and actually convincingly win this game. I'm going to see 3-1. 3-1. Holy mackerel. Uh yeah. All right, you both say wins. So I'm going to say it's going to be Joe's a draw. A loss. No, not a loss. I'm going to say it's a draw. <laughs> I'm going to say it's a uh, a one-one draw, just like the away match. Uh, Red Bull two score first this time, though, but they give up a goal late on a set piece. Calling it now. Wow. Boom. <laughs> very very specific. Okay, let's look at the standings in the East. Not a lot has changed at the top. Tampa Bay is still up there with 36 points, but now Indy 11 is in second place, 34 points and a game in hand on both uh, Tampa Bay and the New York Red Bulls. North Carolina FC, uh, sorry, New York Red Bulls in third. North Carolina FC, uh, fourth place with Nashville. They each have 30 points. Then Ottawa City, or Ottawa City, Ottawa Fury, rather. 
Uh, they've got 27. They're in sixth. Seventh, Louisville City, 26. Eighth, Charleston, uh, 23. Nine, Pittsburgh Riverhounds, 22. And 10, St. Louis FC, 20 points. They are, I feel so, they started off so good this year. They're just falling further and further behind. They're having a great they, run in the Open Cup, but. To, to be fair, they've only played 14 games, too. So. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Uh, then under the line, Beth Steele, Charlotte Independence, Loudoun, Atlanta, Birmingham, Swope Park, Memphis, and of course Hartford uh, pulling up the rear. They are in 10th place. Can we can we just give a uh, uh, womp womp to Dan Metzger, <laughs> who is so talented and deserves to be on better teams than he's been on the last couple of years. Penn FC was a real... Um, difficult situation i think for him and then again this year memphis is just they're, they're very poor and uh i like dan a lot i feel bad that he keeps ending up in places like this so dan we miss you and uh we're sorry that things aren't going better for you out west phoenix rising the cream rises to the top <laughs> <laughs> that's my macho man it's not good uh, <laughs> oh yeah good. brother I told you. I told you. <laughs> I did tell you. <laughs> and, I, they beat, and they and they beat a, a, a talented team this uh this past weekend to convincingly beat Portland too. Yeah, they did. And they're doing it without Junior Flemings, who was a yes. big part of I Oh, there's a Solomon Asante has been Yeah, uh, that's so, true. Been very good. So. And of course Aginaga we talked about last week. Anyway, uh they are opening up a wide lead at the top of the Western Conference table. They've got 35 points. Reno, 1868, 29, right under them. Uh, Fresno FC, 28. Portland Timbers, 2, 27. Tied with El Paso Locomotive, also 27. Austin Bold in sixth with 26. New Mexico United, 26. OKC Energy in eighth with 25. Ninth, Sac Republic. And tenth, Las Vegas Lights that we should call them the Las Vegas buoys. They are dipping under and uh, bouncing back up over the line seemingly week after week. <laughs> so <laughs> who knows how they're going to end the season. Then underneath the line, LA Galaxy 2, Real Monarchs, Rio Grande Valley, Orange County SC, San Antonio FC, Tulsa Roughnecks, Col- Colorado Spring Switchbacks, and Tacoma Defiance, who are now, let's see, they are officially... Worse than Hartford. They've got the same record, but they've given up uh, far more goals. They are at negative 30 on the goal differential. <laughs> Guys. Wow. Whew, negative that's bad. 30. wonder what that... Uh, so that's their goal that's differential, possible. but that's not the total goals they've given up. Hold on, let's see. 44. 44 goals. Holy mackerel. Wow. They had a, they had a stretch where they gave up 16 goals in four games. Yikes. On the road, they've got a very Red Bull 2 uh, 2017 2018 record. They're 0 7 and 2 right now. <laughs> Yowzers. Again, though, they don't really care because they are the Seattle Sounders uh, development team. So it's all about development, folks. Uh, quick shout outs I want to give to the former Red Bulls or current Red Bull players. Uh, or USL players that have taken part in the Gold Cup. Jamaica seems to be the team that leaned hev- most heavily into, I think, uh, the USL. Please correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, but they've got Junior Fleming, Speedy Williams, and Sean Francis. They are all playing big roles uh, for the Jamaican national team and uh, doing very well. They've got a big, big match coming up against the U.S. Was that tomorrow night? Is that right? Uh, yep, it yep. is. Haiti's pl- Haiti and Derek Etienne are also having a heck of a tournament. Haiti in the semifinals, first time ever. Derek Etienne, I think, has been a big part of their uh, revival. Revival? No, it's not a revival. Well, I guess it is because they were a really good team uh, in the 70s, but it's been a while, uh, at least in the region. Uh, but it's been a while since they've had this kind of success, but we are absolutely rooting for you. The fans that have come out to their matches have been fantastic. And I would love to see Haiti beat Mexico. Uh, where do you guys stand on that? I, yeah, I can't, I, I'd agree on that. <laughs> oh, it'd be great if that happened. I want to see Derek Etienne score the winning goal in the gold cup final. I don't care if it's against the U S Derek, make it happen. And then we could talk about, 
uh, how a gold cup winning Derek Etienne uh, gets to give out the worst dancer on the Red Bulls 2 <laughs> award at the end of the season. <laughs> it's going to be fantastic. Um, of course, Aaron Long, uh, former uh, Red Bull 2 captain, he and the U.S. are into the semis uh, to face Jamaica, who we mentioned earlier. But I also want to give a shout out to Zico Lewis, who is having a very nice year for Charleston and a solid Gold Cup for Bermuda. They got their first ever win in the Gold Cup. I'm sure that the the country is very, very proud and deservedly so. Congrats. Let's give a, a little round of applause. Uh, and before we close out for the night, I want to talk about Jared Stroud. Stroud is now the all-time leading assistman uh, for the New York Red Bulls too. He's got six and four, or no, five and four this year, five goals, four assists. We constantly talk about how important he is to the team. I think he's the imp- the appearance leader right now. Uh, you know, I'm going to make these claims. I should just check them out. Oh no, only Lima has played. Uh, more games or started more games rather uh, than Jared Stroud. Even Jordan Scarlett uh, has played less minutes than Jared this year. Same with Evan Laura. We know the kind of talent that he has, but he's in a spot that's really, really difficult, I think, uh, to break through. We've talked about the depth at central midfield and how hard it is to make a name for yourself. The very talented Andrew Tenari, the very talented Dan Metzger, uh, you know, both unable to crack the Red Bulls lineup. Both have shipped out and gone other places. Tanari is continuing to do very, very well. But on the wings, that's been true too. We've seen guys like uh, Junior Flemings, who we mentioned a little while ago. Uh, Jose Aganaga played out there, but he's really more of a central midfielder. But, you know, that is a spot on the Red Bulls where, you know, they've got wingers aplenty. So what do we think it, it does the future hold for Jared Stroud? I think that he's a fantastic player. I think he shows it game in and game out. But does he have enough to crack uh, the MLS lineup eventually? Joe, let's start with you. Uh, you know, I, I, it, it's weird because I, I, I thought about this question a lot. I've thought about this question a lot this year. And I think he fits the system really well. Um, but I just, I don't, I don't know, like, if, if he'll crack it. I mean... To me, I've, I've, me watching Derek Etienne in, in the Gold Cup, I mean, I don't know if he's exactly the perfect fit for the Red Bulls system because uh, I think he would, I think he would just be better um, in a in a different system that utilized his talents a little bit more. So maybe Jared takes his position, but I, I don't like, I can't see him taking like Alex uh, Muriel's position. I can't see. I mean, we still talk. We, we haven't. Florian Velo, unfortunately, got injured this, again this year, and I, he'll be back next year. It's going to be really tough. I mean, the talent is definitely there. I think, you know, he's he's growing more into that leadership role this year with Red Bull 2 and everything. And I think the talent's there, but something just tells me I I, I don't know. That's that's like, that's my answer. I just don't know. Like, I, I want to say yes, but I don't know what the organization, you know, thinks or anything like that. But uh, I'm going to say no, unfortunately. Oh, that's so sad. You brought up Derek Etienne. Etienne and Stroud, same age, 22 years old. But just in terms of, of experience and uh, seasoning, even just you know at the level of uh, talking about being in the system, obviously Derek is way further along in that conversation. And if you think that it's going to be hard for uh, Derek to be a consistent starter and to find minutes, then yeah, I think I think that that also means that Jared's going to have a tough time. Now, where I think uh, maybe he could I, get a break would be if he can successfully you know, transition inside. Uh, I, in the last sec- or at the beginning of the show, I'm talking about how I like him out uh, wide and, and running at defenses that way, and that's where I think I've seen his best performances. If he's going to be able to, to make an impact with the first team, I think it's going to have to be coming in underneath because uh, it, it's just so hard to break through. Now, in another year, we could talk about uh, all the the guys who are leaving or getting older, or you know, does Andy Ivan stick around? He's getting paid a lot of money, but he's clearly a, a depth player right now. They've got Omir Fernandez up there, Derek, Alex, Florian, like you mentioned. Although Florian, I'm also worried about. Uh, 
you know, this is his second major knee injury. He's 27 years old, right? Or 26. So that that's a tough one. That's a really tough one. And it, it's hard to see what his future is going to hold. But yeah, for for Jared, I think it's going to be really, really, really difficult for him to break in. So, without him, you know, torching defenses every single week and and really racking up big numbers to justify uh, bringing him up to the first team, it's it's going to be really hard. And I didn't even mention Danny Royer as one of those wingers. No, we we didn't. The th- the thing is, I would say I I think Omir has uh, i think omir definitely deserves more time Mm -hmm. um playing than he's been getting which is kind of surprising um but i mean you know royer we all know has been the goal machine this year um derek i i don't again again like the whole thing about derek is like i I, the talent is there for sure but i just don't know if the system like i i think ivan i think jared could easily supplant ivan i I just think ivan's kind of i mean I, I see there's a lot of good from Ivan, I see, but then there's not so much. I do the consistency just isn't there. Um, below, I, I mean, we don't, like you mentioned with both of his injury, you know, another major knee injury. I think Alex is, you know, a guy you have to put on the team sheet every week just because of his, his ability to do so much defensive work and so much cleaning up. And he plays really hard and he puts in such a good shift every time. Uh, I, I, I think, I, I, I don't know if, because John talked about this earlier in the season about transitioning Jared more inside because uh, I, and I don't know if that's coming from higher up that maybe they want to see if he can be that guy that, you know, they bring in and that can find that pass um, much like Kaku does for the first team. Uh, But I mean, we haven't seen much of it this year. I don't know, you know, maybe they, they, maybe they tried it out and they feel he's more comfortable on the outside I don't know, maybe it's by design, but it, that's something to keep an eye on as the season goes along. I will say that you, you just referred to Daniel Royer as a goal machine. He's got four goals. <laughs> Sorry, I honestly... It, right? It seems like I he mean, it mean, seems I mean, like he puts himself in a lot of good positions. He probably should have more goals, but he he's should. only got I four. Mean, well, I mean, in the years past, he's been a goal yeah. machine, but this year it's... Yeah, well, uh, well this year look, it's been... If you have an outside winger who is putting up double dig- digits regularly, and that's what Royer has done over the last couple of seasons, he's generally uh, you know, averaging about 10 or 12 goals. Yeah, that's great. I think that's fantastic. Yeah. And it's, it's hard to argue taking someone like that out. Uh, so then the other side of that is uh, who wins the dogfight. And I know that you said that you don't think Etienne is the right guy in the system, but he... he does really really well uh, in the right circumstances and i think um having uh a sort of skill set diversity across the wingers has helped them this season and has helped them uh continue to score when they haven't had a consistent lineup um but it, it, it'll be interesting we'll have to see where that goes bill what do you think stroud in mls it's hard to say. I feel I feel like Joe said, you know, there's really not room right now on, on the team for him to fit in. I All think right. that's kind of where, where the struggle is. But uh, I think he's definitely got the talent for it. There's no question about that. It's just hard to fit him in on the team with that, you know, the, with the players that are, are currently out there. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> of course, uh, you know, we're talking about guys I'm forgetting to mention. We also have Epps. There's so many wingers. It's yeah. ridiculous. Yeah. Um, all right. Yeah, we'll we'll revisit this question towards the end of the season. I think it'll be a good like uh, uh, place to to measure where things have gone, and it'll get, we'll have a better idea of what the I think the first team will look like based on how everything shakes out. You can follow us on Twitter. I'm at underscore Joe Goldstein. I'm at Bill TNJ. I am at Jstein15. And if you want to follow the show, and we hope you do, we are at Raising Bull Cast. That's one bull Raising Bull Cast, and of course. That's on Twitter. You can also follow our work at Red Bulls News Network at rbnn.us or RB News Network on Twitter. You can find us on Facebook.com slash Raising Bulls. You can go to RaisingBulls.com where we keep all of our episodes. We're on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, Spotify. If there's a podcast 
uh, service out there, we are on it. And if we're not, let us know and we'll get on it. We're part of the Beautiful Game Network at BGN.FM. They've got so many great shows. Uh, Seriously Loco, Foxtrot Pod, Sock Takes, the other football podcast, 901 Soccer Pod, and so much more. They cover MLS, USL, Premier League, NWSL. They've got podcasts. They've got written content. Go there. It, It will be worth your time. Trust me. We'd like to thank our sponsor, Golden Goal Press, the best choice for you to get your custom shirts, hats, mugs, and other items for just yourself or your organization. Check out their amazing products at a fraction of the price of other places at goldengoldpress.com. And last but not least, we want to thank our sp- our sponsor, our sponsor. We're going to thank our sponsor. Roughneck Scarves, the official scuff scarf. Oh, my God. That was my face. On a roll. Yeah. Thanks to our sponsor, (laughs) Roughneck Scarves, the official scarf supplier of MLS, USL, and U.S. soccer. Get custom scarves for your group or team at roughneckscarves.com. For myself, Mr. Joe Steen and Mr. Bill Toomey, thank you very much and have a great night. You know, the clapping used to be so slow around these parts. (laughs) 